Lesson number one. In the key of C, C is the one chord. It consists of C, E, and G. C is one, E is three, G is five. The four chord is built on F. F is one, A is three, C is five. The five chord is built on G. G is one, although on the one chord, G is five, but on the five chord, G is one. Wait, I'm confused. Is that right? The topic for today was inspired by a comment I received on one of my previous videos about improvising on the blues. Your remark that the language of theory is simply the way we describe sound strikes me as a crucial point that should be made more often, especially when speaking to amateurs. Far too often, the uninitiated are introduced to improvisation through the arcane language of chords and scales when the goal is to reach the sounds they hear so clearly in their heads. Okay, so now let's talk about theory and its relevance to the process of improvisation. In Jazz Tactics, I talk about theory being one of the four T's. These are the four things that I suggest you need to address if you want to learn how to improvise. The others are tunes, transcription, and transposition. Understanding theory is important because without it, you're essentially musically illiterate. You can learn to speak without learning to read, and you can learn to improvise by ear without learning any of the theory. But you'll be at a disadvantage when it comes to communicating with other musicians and learning new music. Now, music theory, which of course includes the basic notation of written music, is sort of a shorthand way of specifying a sound that we're trying to hear or produce. The teacher, who spent years and years making sense of it, runs the risk of overwhelming the student with what seem like facts and figures as if improvisation was akin to math. Of course, when you set out to learn anything, you encounter a vast and confusing landscape of information and options. All you can do is take it one step at a time and allow yourself enough time with each step to let it sink in on a deeper level. The commenter makes the point that without an in-depth understanding and presentation of the sound that results from the application of theory, well, it may confuse more than help. You can use theory to explain what a dominant seven chord is, but you have to use your ears to understand what a dominant seven chord sounds like and how it functions within a chord progression. Ultimately, you need both. If you're able to recognize the sound of a dominant seven chord, knowing how it's derived and the various ways it can function in a chord progression, well, that can be a great help to the improviser. Conversely, if seeing the chord symbol for a dominant seven chord conjures up a sound in your ear, that allows your eyes to help your ears more quickly make sense and substance of what you hear. So the question then is, do you try to learn the sound before worrying about what to call it, or do you use the theory to help you discover the sound by playing it on your instrument? Now, I agree with the commenter that the ideal situation is to start with the sound. When you learn music by ear as you do when you're transcribing, the understanding and the gratification are immediate. On the other hand, a theoretical concept takes time and practice to assimilate it on a subconscious level. If you learn or practice a scale today and then you try to use it when you're improvising tonight, your thought process is on what you know or what you've learned rather than on what you hear. Now, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to do that. Actions have to occur on a conscious level before they make it to the subconscious. But don't expect it to come out sounding as natural as it will when that scale has been absorbed to the point that you no longer have to think about it. The commenter compares music to writing, in that we can analyze what someone has played or written to better understand what we're hearing or reading. But the process of creation is completely different than analysis after the fact. This is one reason why I'm less interested in analyzing transcribed solos. Analysis might reveal that a line in the solo was drawn from the half-hole diminished scale, but the soloist wasn't thinking of it that way. One of the great misconceptions among jazz students is that improvisation consists of memorizing what the commenter describes as the arcane language of chords and scales, and then making a series of theoretical decisions at lightning speed in real time. In truth, it's a lot simpler than that. We don't think of walking or riding a bike as a complex or difficult thing to do, but if you had to consciously focus on all the individual muscular actions it takes to do those things, you'd never get anywhere. Eventually, walking and riding a bike becomes second nature with no conscious thought needed to perform them. But even so, it is still possible to trip or fall down, particularly when you're on unfamiliar terrain. Further, if you want to be a great runner or a bicycle racer, well, then you'll need to study the individual actions in search of incremental improvement. But when it comes time for performance, your mind cannot be on those things. It has to be on the bigger picture. For an improvising musician, the big picture is simply to hear a sound in your head and reproduce it on your instrument. Now, it's worth noting here that vocalists are at a disadvantage when it comes to translating theory into sound with no mechanical means to do that, but they have an advantage when it comes to getting the sound in the head to come out of the instrument. A vocalist doesn't need to know what note she's singing in order to sing it, and knowing on a theoretical level what note she's supposed to sing doesn't really help her unless she's got perfect pitch, and even then, focusing on the right and wrong notes is as ineffective for an improvising vocalist as it is for an instrumentalist. 
any note can be the right note if you're in the moment enough to hear it in the context of the harmonic and rhythmic framework and therefore able to construct a melodic path forward. Focusing on what you know in this situation, the theory, can inhibit your ability to listen and react. Now this goes to the core of what every jazz musician needs to be able to do. You need to be able to play what you hear, and you need to hear something that's worth playing. All the pedagogical aspects of jazz improvisation, including transposition, tunes, transcription, and yes, theory, are with the goal of expanding your ability to conceive and produce musical ideas. Learning to improvise is a long and typically slow process, but there are rewards along the way as your ear becomes more adept at hearing and deciphering sounds, your expanding vocabulary gives you ways to respond to those sounds, and your understanding of theory helps you remember those sounds and communicate them to other musicians. The bottom line is nobody can teach you to improvise, but somebody with knowledge and experience can give you some direction and ideas for things to try as you teach yourself. That's my goal in these videos, and your comments and questions are helpful to me and to everybody else who's trying to figure out how to do this thing.